My name is Renee Clark. This lecture is over Chapter 7 of the Think Python eBook. Chapter 7 is about iteration. Now, in programming, iteration is the ability to run a block of statements repeatedly. We saw a kind of iteration with recursion and when we were using the for loop. Let's next look at reassignment. Python uses the equal sign for assignment. I think we all remember that from an earlier chapter. And it's legal to make more than one assignment to the same variable. Keep in mind that the new assignment makes an existing variable refer to a new value and stop referring to the old value. For example, here we have x equal to 5. When we run that, that shows an output of 5. We can reassign that x to 7, and it now contains 7. If we were to set a equal to 5, we're going to print a to show that it equals 5. Then we're going to set a variable named b equal to a. So b and a now equal. Next, we're going to reassign a and give it set it equal to 3 now a and b are no longer equal. And we can show this by printing out both a and b. So let's run that code. We see that a is initially 5, then it becomes 3, and b is still equal to 5. Now reassigning variables is useful, but you have to be careful. When a value of a variable changes a lot, it makes the code very difficult to follow, read, and debug. So a common way of handling this is through reassignment in using an update, where the new value depends on the old. A couple of things you have to keep in mind when doing is so let's give it a try. c equal to c plus 1. What happened? We have a name error. This happens because, as the message tells us, C has not yet been defined. You can't do an update until you have initialized that variable. So here's another example. We're going to initialize the variable Z and set it equal to 0. Then we're going to update Z by incrementing it by 1 and printing it out. So now you can see we initially set it to 0. We added 1 to that, so z now equals 1. Again, updating a variable by adding 1 is called incrementing. Subtracting 1 is called decrementing. Another means of looping is the while statement. So when we have those tasks that we are repetitive and we want to keep doing them over and over, because those are things people don't normally do well as repetitive tasks, so here's our while statement. Here's an example of a function we're calling countdown that will go through and decrement counting off until we get to zero, and then it will blast off, kind of like doing a countdown for a launch process. So we're going to define our function here, and now we're going to call our function just with a variable of three. And so you see countdown goes 3, 2, 1, blast off. So it says while n is less than 0. And the while statement, the syntax ends with a colon. It's an indention because it's part of the definition of the countdown function. And it's following similar syntax because when we go to the second line of the while, it's also indented. And so while n is greater than zero, it's going to print in. Then it's going to decrement in, and if it's going to continue doing that until n becomes equal to zero or less than zero. In our case, it becomes equal to zero, and so it simply prints blast off, breaks out of that while loop on its own. The flow of execution is pretty easy to follow here. So you determine whether the condition is true. Here's our condition. We determine whether it's true. If it's false, we're going to exit, and we're going to go to the next line of code, which is down here with the print. If it's true, we're going to go through these two lines of code, and we're going to keep looping through until it's no longer true, and it exits out to print blast off. 
and that's type of this type of flow is called a loop because of how it's deep stepping through the loop going back to the top. Now remember the body of the loop should change the value of one or more variables so the condition becomes false eventually and the loop terminates. Otherwise you end up in an infinite loop and that's a bad thing. Now sometimes when you are creating a loop or you're setting up your code, you don't necessarily know how you're going to end the loop until partway through the body. And in that case, you can use a break statement to jump yourself out of the loop. In a, for example, suppose you take input from a user until they type done. So here's some code you could write. You could create a while loop, say while this is true, line equal to input, where you're asking for input, and if line is equal to done, break out of it. Otherwise, print the line and go back to the top of the while loop and just continue to run. When they hit the break, it will pop them out of the while down to line 6 and print done. So let's try running this code. Now, I could say yes. It just prints it and goes back. That's asking for more input. No. Five. Seven. But if I print done, I get my done capitalized with an exclamation point here. And I'm now not asking for any more input. It broke out of the loop because it hit the break. Now the loop condition is true, which is always true, so the loop runs until it hits that break. We're talking about while true, this and this and this are just going to keep going. If this hits this here and it's false, it's going to break out to here. So it seems a little confusing at first, but it's very common to check the condition anywhere in the loop and then you can express for the stop condition rather affirmatively rather than negatively. So stop when this happens and then keep going until this happens. Those are ways of doing things. Your text gives you an example of how to create your own square root program. Loops are often used in programs that compute numerical results. By starting with an approximate answer and then iterating and trying to improve it. This is the example we're going to be using with the square root. Suppose you want to know the square root of a number. You start with an almost any estimate, call it x, and you can then compute a better estimate with this formula. So, for example here, let's say that a is 4, x is 3. So we have our formula up here where y is equal to x plus a divided by x, all of that divided by 2. So we're going to assign 4 to a, 3 to x. And then we're going to run the program, which will look at y equal to x plus a divided by x divided by 2. What's in control here? The division here will happen before the addition here. All of this inside the parentheses will happen before this division. Let's create that code and let's print out the results in y. So we see that the square root that we're trying to determine is getting close. Big long number. So you can see that the correct result for the square root of 4 equal to 2. We want to keep refining our code. So we would run this a few times so that y will get closer to 2. And here we're just setting x equals y and then y is equal to the formula. So we're just going to keep running this over and over. So rather than sitting here and running that code manually over and over, let's set it up as a loop. In general, we don't know how many times we need to loop in some of these situations. We're going to use a while statement and break out when x is equal to y so we can stop. So let's set up this code, run it, and we can see that 
It keeps changing as we go until we get to 2. What happens now that we're that at 2? What happens if we run it again? We keep getting 2 because we've hit the end of things. Here, we're going to take all of this code. We're going to build our own function, my square. We're going to pass it two variables, a and x. And we are going to put in the code here, while true, creating y. When y is equal to x, breaking out. Otherwise, setting x equal to y, and then returning x. So I'm going to create my function. Now I'm going to call my function. And you'll see the first time through, I'm getting 2.1666665. Same answer that we got when we first ran the formula up here. This chapter also talks about algorithms. Keep in mind, an algorithm isn't anything scary. It's just a general process for solving a category of problems. The other thing to keep in mind from this chapter is how, as your programs go, you probably want to do your debugging by working in sections so that you can debug smaller pieces of code. Just like when creating complex functions, build them slowly and debug them slowly so that it's easier to take care of debugging, solving problems, and creating good and efficient code. If you have questions, please consult your professor.